Hello everyone and welcome to your first lesson in biopsychology. Now a lot of people panic when they hear the words biopsychology because they think it's going to be uh, something that only biologists will understand um, and that other people who don't take biology as a subject will really really struggle with. That isn't the case. Okay, This, uh, this topic is something that everybody um, can understand equally and there really is nothing to be worried about. The first topic that we're going to look at is going to be the nervous system and the endocrine system. Now the first thing you need to know about the nervous system is that it is made up of a network of cells in the human body um, and it's our internal communication system. Um, it has two main functions. The first one is to collect, process and respond to information in the environment and the second is to coordinate the working of different organs and cells within the body. Now as you can see here the nervous system has, has actually got a lot of subdivisions to it. So you've got the, the nervous system as a whole which is then uh, split into the peripheral and central nervous system. The central nervous system is then split into the spinal cord and the brain, whereas the peripheral nervous system uh, is further divided into the autonomic and somatic nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system is then further divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Now I'll come to all of those bits individually in a little while, but it's just nice for you to see um, how the nervous system is broken down and that is something that you're going to need to know. Now we're going to start with the central nervous system. As I said earlier, the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, the brain is the center of all conscious awareness in humans. Um, it's divided into two hemispheres and the outer layer of the brain is known as the cerebral cortex. Uh, you can think of the cerebral cortex a little bit like a tea cozy that sits on top of the brain. The cerebral cortex is highly developed in humans and it is what distinguishes us um, and our higher mental functions from other animals. The spinal cord, on the other hand, is an extension of the brain and its job is to transport messages to and from the peripheral nervous system. It's also responsible for reflexes, so for example uh, pulling your hand away from a hot plate when you touch it. The peripheral nervous system is the other part of the nervous system, the other stem as it were, and that is made up of the autonomic and the somatic nervous system. Now the peripheral nervous system transmits messages via neurons to and from the central nervous system. Um, and as I said, it is further divided into the somatic ner nervous system, which receives information from the senses and then transmits that information to the central nervous system. Um, it's also responsible for muscle movement as well. Then you've also got the autonomic nervous system which is responsible for vital functions such as heart rate, breathing, digestion, sexual arousal um, and your stress responses. The autonomic nervous system is made up of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system and it's these two different systems that we need for our primary stress response um, also known as the fight or flight response. I'll come on to the fight or fight flight response in a little while 
Um, we're going to look at the endocrine system first, though. So the endocrine system, as you can see in the picture on the left, is made up of various different glands in the body. Um, and its job is to work alongside the nervous system to control vital functions in the body. Um, so the endocrine system instructs various glands in the body to release hormones into the blood. So for example, you've got the adrenal gland which is responsible for producing adrenaline which is then in turn responsible for getting our body ready for fight or flight. You've also got the thyroid gland, which is responsible for producing thyroxine, which is a hormone that affects cells in the heart, so it increases heart rate. Um, it also increases metabolic rates, um, which then in turn affects growth rates as well. Um, you've got the pineal gland as well, very, very important for us. It produces melatonin. Um, uh, which is all about sleep. So when melatonin is produced, um, that's when we start to get sleepy, and then that is when we sleep, and then when melatonin stopped stops being produced, that's when we wake up again. Um, you've also got other things, like obviously you've got testicles uh, in males and ovaries in females, which in turn produce sex hormones, um, testosterone and estrogen. Now, you don't have to know all of these things, however, it would be good for you to know a couple of these, so the gland, what it produces, and what effect that those hormones have on the body. It's a nice question that you might come across in exams um, to outline what is meant by a gland and use an example of what, an, what a gland does. Hormones affect cells throughout the entire body, but they only affect those cells that have receptors for that particular hormone. Okay, so that could be only in one particular organ. However, it could also be throughout the entire body. So that's just something to bear in mind. Now, You've got two very different systems there that work together to control important functions in the body. And it's a very, very common exam question for you to have to distinguish between the two systems. So just um, so you can put it into context, um, you've got the endocrine system on the one side that uses chemical messengers to make things happen, whereas you've got the nervous system that uses electrical impulses. Um, you've also got very long-lasting effects on the side of the endocrine system um, versus very short-lived effects in the nervous system. The endocrine system takes much longer to work, um, whereas the nervous system is very, very quick. So if you take, for example, the reflex action, um, if a reflex took very long to actually carry out, then by the time you'd actually completed the action, you probably would have already been hurt. So that has to happen very, very, very quickly. Um, and then the endocrine system has very, very widespread effects and that are often much more permanent as well, whereas the nervous system um, has very localized effects and which are then more temporary as well. Now there are times when both systems have to work together and one of those times is the fight or flight response or the, the stress response. Okay. Um, so when our bodies or our brains perceive some kind of a threat or some kind of a stress uh, response, um, it kicks into action because it wants to help us to survive. Um, now it can be a very very real threat um, or it could be something that's just perceived as a threat, for example a friend jumping out at you and making you jump or watching a scary film that makes you jump. 
your body or your brain doesn't know the difference between a real threat and a not a real threat, so it just reacts in the same way. So when a stressor is perceived, the hypothalamus, which you can see there nestled in the center of your brain, triggers the sympathetic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system changes from its usual resting state, which is the parasympathetic state, and changes to the sympathetic state. Okay. Um, when that happens, adrenaline is released into the bloodstream. Now adrenaline is produced in the adrenal gland which as you can see in the picture just sits on top of the kidney. Um, more specifically um, adrenaline is released from the adrenal medulla which is in the center of the adrenal gland. Now that's released directly into the bloodstream which results in physical arousal or physical changes that are needed for fight or flight. Okay, I'll just show you. Um, these are some of the changes that can occur during sympathetic arousal. So you've got things like increased heart rate, um, increased breathing, dilated pupils. Um, very interestingly, you've also got a complete shutdown of non-essential systems. So digestion, for example, is shut down because you don't need digestion for survival. You shut that down and then take any of the energy that would be used for digestion and put it into either fighting or fleeing. And then once the threat has passed, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and returns the body to its natural resting state. Um, that's the parasympathetic state, also known as rest and digest response. Okay, and if I just put this little box back up there for you to see, um, some of the things that the parasympathetic nervous system then does is it stimulates digestion, it increases, uh, sorry, it decreases heart rate, decrease, decreases uh, breathing rate, constricts pupils again, and just gets you back into that relaxed state that you need to be in. Okay, that was the first lesson in biopsychology. I hope you found it useful, and good luck with the next lesson.